Welcome in. We're excited for another episode of the Financial Planning for Oil and Gas Professionals podcast. Uh, we have a special guest on this episode. We're going to be speaking with Alan Killian. Alan is with WPX Energy, and WPX up in Tulsa was recently acquired by Devon. Uh, the merger date was January 7th, and uh, so they're going through the transition now. And we were really excited to talk with Alan because it's a similar situation to something we see a lot in the industry, and that is leaving a corporate position with a large oil and gas company uh, in, in transitioning into your own consulting firm. And so going from a giant company to a much smaller LLC, uh, and we're excited to, to dive into some of the uh, intricacies that go along with that. Um, it's, it's an interesting topic because it's something that I think we're going to see a lot more in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, the potential to, to run your own business is uh, significantly easier today than it was 20, 30 years ago. And uh, we're going we're gonna to see this a lot more. And so we're excited to, to talk with Alan. And uh, Alan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Glad to be here. Great. Uh, well, we'll dive right in. And uh, I, uh, I, I know Alan, I've spoke with him and I'm, I'm good friends with Alan's son, Blaine. Uh, met him at the University of Arkansas. But for all of our listeners, Alan, we'd love to just uh, hear a brief overview of yourself and your brief overview of your career. Okay, great. Uh, name's Alan Killian. Uh, grew up a uh, native Oklahoman. Uh, been here for quite, quite some time. Uh, went to the University of Oklahoma, graduated from the University of Oklahoma in 1981 with a petroleum engineering degree. Uh, subsequently went to work for City Service Oil and Gas, which uh, immediately became Oxdale Petroleum. Uh, spent almost 20 years with, uh, with Oxy, uh, various locations around Oklahoma and Texas, uh, finishing up my career with, with Oxy uh, in the Houston, Texas, uh, had, had a great, great time at, at Oxy. Uh, numerous challenges, uh, opportunities uh, started out in pretty much the uh, drilling completion type team, production team, very operations oriented. Uh, through the years, moved into a marketing role and was uh, head of uh, team lead of one of the uh, commodity, specifically natural gas commodity trading side of the business. Um, about 2000, uh, had an opportunity to leave Houston and come back into Oklahoma working for the Williams Corporation. Uh, that was at the time of, uh, if you'll remember the big trading companies, the Enron's, the Dynagy's, uh, everybody was trying to create this, this massive trading organization. And so, uh, had an opportunity to come to Tulsa. It was one of almost 1,200 traders on the Williams trade floor at that time and uh, went to work for Williams. In 2012, that was two, uh, 2000, in 2012, uh, the exploration production side of the business within Williams was spun out to its own individual company called WPX. And uh, they took the natural gas marketing side of the business and moved that into WPX. As you can appreciate in the early 2000s, Enron and Dynagy blew up, went away. And so that was no longer a business model. Uh, so it was much, much smaller, much tighter uh, controls around the trading side of that business. So I went with the WPX side. Uh, in 2014, 2015, we had new leadership at uh, WPX come in. I had the opportunity to move back into the operations side. Uh, and was trying to marry my trading acumen with some of my previous operations and uh, created a, a centralized supply chain team and uh, subsequently had a few other roles in this last few years. But uh, from the mid-20 teens to, to now, uh, was, was running uh, the supply chain team and then, like I said, some other infrastructure and health and safety and those other type of roles. So... Uh, came to about, as you mentioned earlier, WPX and Devon have decided to merge on um, January 7th. Uh, and in, in the sense, it was time for me to re 
really kind of step out of the business and, and had an opportunity to leave. And uh, my time at WPX is, is very short, probably down to about the next eight, nine weeks, it looks like. Congratulations on, uh, on that transition. Um, it's, it's remarkable because it sounds like you've done so many things from risk management to marketing to uh, operations. So in addition to kind of the, the change of control, what's, what spurred you to, to begin to move towards uh, independent consulting in this next phase of your career versus trying to find another role with uh, an, another company. You want, you, would you mind talking a little more about that? Sure. Uh, I think we all reach a stage of life uh, when you want a little bit more independence. And it's like, what have you worked for? Uh, Justin, you mentioned knowing one of my sons. Uh, Blaine's one of four. Uh, I have grandchildren as well. They have spread out. They live, most everybody lives in different cities. I have uh, son in Arkansas. I have a couple sons in, in Houston, Texas. I have a son here in town. Uh, the time that my wife and I would like to spend with our family is extremely important. Uh, and you try to marry that. Uh, I go back to one of the comments I made earlier about marrying my operations acumen with the trading acumen that I developed in the trading. It's very similar there as well. Is, is there a way to marry uh, our desire to be around family and kids and grandkids with a business side that I'm just not ready to step aside 100%. And so it, it felt like that uh, independent consulting may be the way to go. And so my wife and I talked a little bit about uh, whether we should do this or not. Uh, I think it convinced her that hey, I'm, as long as we have um, the power over our schedule, and uh, and we can we can balance what we want to do, uh, family with the consulting. Then I think that's the role that I wanted to go. And so we've been in the in the forefront here of setting up a consulting company. And and as I part ways with WPX, then that will hopefully take uh, have a few more legs underneath it. That's really interesting. It's it's fascinating to see the transition that the that the younger generation is going through. Uh, I think about my own dad, and uh, he went to Kansas State. I went to Kansas State. Uh, about fifty of our living relatives went to Kansas State, um, and so there was never there was never a thought uh, that he wasn't going to go to Kansas State. There was never a thought that I wasn't going to go to Kansas State. There was also, it was a given that he was going to move back to Kansas City. And that was where he was going to live. It was where he was going to work. And then I think about my own story and, and my wife, Lauren, and I, I, I think maybe my wife had, you know, she grew up in Texas. She was in the Dallas area. Maybe she had been to the Woodlands. I had never been to the Woodlands. And uh, we moved here um, several years ago and have been here ever since. And so I think this this dynamic where this, this younger generation is moving anywhere uh, and they truly look at a map and they're, they're willing to go anywhere for career or lifestyle. Um, and so I think, I think you're going to see this type of dynamic where it's not enough to just have the job you want in whether it's Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Houston, uh, there is such a there is such a demand to be able to have the freedom to go over to Fayetteville and see family, go down to Houston and uh, spend a few weeks in different parts, especially as especially as you have grandkids. Um, and so, I'd love to focus a little bit more and, and hear a little bit more about independent consulting. Uh, Alan, you mentioned that you've seen a few colleagues do this, go into independent consulting after their traditional career. What would you say are the biggest skills or experiences that translate to doing well when you're on your own? I would probably put, there's a, there's a magnitude of skill sets that, that are needed, of course. Uh, you're only as good as your skill set. Uh, and when you're hanging a shingle out, it's how do you market yourself? But if I try to boil down the two main things that I see in my peers that have created consulting companies and have been successful 
uh, I try to look back at my career and, and look at what I was uh, good at and what allowed me to, to maneuver through a corporation to the levels I did. Uh, I'd say it boils down into, into, into two things. Uh, the first, first one is listening. I think, think to survive, you need to listen. Uh, there was a part of the time of my career uh, back in the early 2000s after I came to Williams and I was on that massive 1200 person trade floor. Uh, it was a very dynamic time in the industry. It was a very dynamic time at Williams. Uh, and you had a lot of autonomy and a lot of freedom. Uh, but one of my roles was really a natural gas business development type of type of role. And I had the ability to travel around the United States, predominantly to a large customer base in, in, the, in the mega cities, the New York cities, the Miami, Florida's, Atlanta's, San Francisco, LA. Uh, and I was working with the local distribution companies there. But you would walk in and you really didn't necessarily have a product in mind to sell them, you spent your time listening to what their problems were. And once you listened to what their problems were, you came back and you said, how do we solve these? How can we work together to solve the problem you have? I didn't go in with knowing they had a problem. It was truly a listening uh, type of uh, meeting. And, and I think when you move into the consulting side, you're moving and you're talking to people that you may not necessarily understand where they've been or where they're going to and where they want to go. And so you're trying to help them maneuver along that same pathway. And to do that, you've really got to sit and listen and almost just remain silent in the sense of let me hear what your problem is. And then I'll take that back and I will think through that. The second bucket I would probably throw in there is, is very, very important is networking. Uh, we can't do this on our own, okay? I, I can't sit in my, my kitchen and, and create a business and do this by myself. I, I need expertise. And having, this was year 40 for me in this oil and gas industry. Uh, I've been very, very fortunate of having really two companies over 40 years, 20 years and 20 years. Uh, I think that's highly unusual. But during that time frame of, of working from uh, the operations side, into the marketing side, and then back on the operations, uh, my network uh, was pretty vast. Uh, and I think that all of my consulting friends and peers, their networks are very vast as well. They may be in different buckets, but I've got a friend that's gone out on consulting within the last two or three weeks. He was on the trade floor with me here at Williams. His network's tremendously different. He has the network with the big, large investment companies around the, uh, the United States. He was, he was more into finance. He was more into the treasury uh, of, the, of WPX. And so his network's different than my network, which was supply chain uh, and marketing was more into natural gas marketing, was more into the vendors that are in our operations. But as we move forward into hanging the ARK Consulting shingle out my door, uh, I think you have to listen and then you're gonna have to pull on your network. That's fantastic. And that, that really is, it's interesting that regardless of what you're doing, listening is one of the most critical skills that, that you can begin to work on. Uh, and it's, it's interesting you mentioned that. Uh, Jared and I would, would say that the DNA of our firm, and this is kind of pulling, pulling the sheets back and, and getting a look under, uh, under, the, under the rug here, but uh, in our firm, the DNA of our firm, it, it, it is comprised to a certain degree of a book by Patrick Lencioni. And uh, Patrick Lencioni, famous business consultant who's wrote a lot of best-selling books, uh, but one of his books, Getting Naked, uh, is the best business book I have ever read. Um, and the, the quick synopsis there is listening is a skill. And, and when you are going into any type of business situation where you're trying to serve another person or serve another corporation, understanding who are they and what do they need and what are they looking uh, for here is just an invitation.
valuable skill, but you have to, you have to take yourself out of it and you have to almost take your own selfishness out of it and instead be more interested in the other person than you're, than you are yourself. Um, I think that's factual. I, I think the other piece within the listening side is if you sit and listen, people will talk. People love to talk about themselves. They like to talk about their family. They love to talk about their jobs. And I'm not sure that, you know, we all have, whether it's your family or your personal life, your, your corporation, whatever, it, we all have a little bit of warts, little bit of gaps throughout the entire uh, the process. We probably don't, we overlook those and we don't see them. But when you're articulating about your history or, or where we want to go, you'll probably expound on that. And if you're just sitting listening, you'll, you'll find those gaps that, that people need without them really articulating saying, hey, hey, Justin, hey, Jared, I need this. And so uh, I think listening, like I said, listening is number, number one on my list and num number two right behind it, it's networking because we need people. Absolutely. And I think, I think that's such a good point, Alan, because, because they're the experts, right? They know what they need. They reached out to you for a reason. So just, you know, figuring out and get a good assessment of, Hey, what do these people actually need? What questions are they asking before, you know, you're not the expert in them. They're the expert in them. And it's, it's a lot similar in our business, you know, where people come to us because they have something they're working through and they just need a second set of eyes, a trusted opinion, somebody to, to kind of delegate that to, but it's interesting because you, you made you made a good point towards the end of talking about uh, the network. It seems like there's a lot of oil and gas consultants, but you kind of touched on something specialization. So you have a network, but different people in the profession and in kind of the consulting space have different specialties. So as you as you're thinking about your business, what what's going to be what's going to be your specialty uh, and, and focal point in in this space? Because there are a lot of oil and gas consultants. I think what I see and what I bring to the table is, is a little unique. Um, I go back to, you mentioned, Jared, my, my trading days, my risk management, and those type of things. What I tried to bring to the supply chain side was a commercial negotiation that had a foundation, underlying foundation around risk management. Um, and I, I think the other piece that, that, that I can bring to the table is understanding the gaps in the current supply chain, uh, and where we're headed. Uh, I think there's things such as, uh, there's a fast moving digital transformation in our business. Okay. Uh, you see it every day when you, you open the newspaper or, or that's, that's probably antiquated. Nobody opens a newspaper anymore. You listen to the news and uh, McDonald's is bringing in robots now or Domino's has a self-driving car. Uh, that, that transformation is, is fast and furious. And the oil and gas industry has always been thought of as this old antiquated dinosaur. We keep doing things the same way over and over and over. But I think there's such a move afoot right now with uh, the ability to change things from a digital perspective or an automated perspective. Uh, and then you marry that on top of uh, the, the pressure that everybody's getting from an ESP side. Uh, I saw that a little bit with one of my roles was, was managing uh, health and safety and air emissions and things like that. So trying to marry trading uh, with my supply chain side, with a little bit of ESP, I, I think I, I see some gaps, especially with uh, maybe I, I could never, probably never walk into the, the big majors, the BPs, the Amicos, or the, the BP Amicos, the, the uh, Exxons of the world, and, and help them. They've got a magnitude of people, but uh, the smaller companies, uh, I think probably have some gaps and they're not ready to make the move as quickly or can make, maybe they may be ready to make the move, but they're probably not as uh, hands-on being able to make the move into where this industry is going. Uh, this industry, I think, has always prided itself on changing the world. Uh, we've changed the world for the better. Uh, we've, we've allowed fossil fuels to be 
uh, stable, cheap energy. Uh, you take all the byproducts of fossil fuels and, and when you look at the things you've got with, from the shirt you wear to the, uh, the iPhone you've got in your pocket, and those are all fossil fuel derivatives. But we've never denied that we need to, need to embrace other uh, things such as wind and solar and, and hydro and, and balance that to give the, the world a cheaper, more stable energy source. And so I just think I've been in a unique position to be able to see some of these these changes. Hmm. I so, I think oh I'm just gonna say I think that's so brilliant. Uh, it's and we talk about this a lot is having a niche and being specialized because it, it doesn't sound like you're gonna be all things to all people. You have a very specific you know mid sized company, and you, where you really thrive is more of the supply chain risk management stuff. But what that does with your network is, you know, a consultant may specialize in something else and they have a question that's more in your alley and, and they send the work that way. And I think that's so brilliant specializing because it co creates this collaborative environment of, hey, I'm not going to be all things to all people in light of my experience. Here's what I'm the best at. And if there's something that comes across my desk and maybe it's not a good fit, you have someone in your network who you can refer that to and, and vice versa. So I think that's a that's a brilliant strategy. Oh, I think that's that's where we're at. And I think with the consolidation of the industry, uh, you know, there's just going to be less and less and less companies. There's going to be less people. Uh, and uh, sadly, uh, there are less of my age people that um, have a lot of experience. The positive side is we're turning the business over to your age. And, and that's, that's awesome. That, that is just going to be fantastic for the industry. It's going to be fantastic for you there's big gaps in the age difference in who's in the industry and who's leading the industry. And uh, since you have such a big age gaps, you have big information and, and experience gaps as well. It really will be interesting to see that dynamic play out. Uh, and Alan, just like you mentioned, it's, it's fascinating. I, I feel like there's not another industry that has done a worse job at, at PR um, in the sense that, oil and gas has done such an unbelievable amount of good in the world. Uh, but the narrative around oil and gas can be very negative, as we know. Uh, and it's, it's often forgotten uh, just how much of a role the industry has played in, in increasing the quality of life uh, around the globe. And <clears throat> the uh, North Face video that, that went viral a few weeks ago uh, just such an excellent example of the world doesn't even realize how many products, how, how much of their life is dependent on this industry on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but take that a step further. The world doesn't realize just how much good ha has happened as a result of, of work in this industry. Um, I'd love to uh, pivot to a, a little bit more of a, a financial planning question just with your new venture. Um, and, and that question is, what does success look like? And I'll give a quick kind of paraphrase on that or be a little bit more specific. Uh, when you start a company, for some people, success can be, well, we need to make X amount of dollars, uh, whether it's a, a big number or a, a, a small number, or success can also be, uh, I want to work 10 hours a week and do excellent work, but I would rather make $50,000 a year and have absolute autonomy, absolute freedom, or is it, no, I want to replace my income plus some. Um, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. What is success for you in this next step? I think I would go back to my earlier comment about work-life balance. Um, we always try to do work-life balance. I probably got that way out of skew at a, at a young, intermediate, and probably older age, I was, uh, uh, I love to come to the office. I love to be at the office. I love to be on my iPhone. I, uh, so my work-life balance was, was probably way out of whack. Um, I needed to go back the other way. Uh, I wanted to go back the other way. So when you talk about success, uh, having the freedom to have a, a role with, a problem in the problem solving arena with a company, but being able to tell them, no, I'm on the road today with my wife. We're going 
to go see somebody. We're going to go see grandkids or no, we're going to go see some historical sites or whatever it is and making sure that I take care of uh, the relationship side of my family, relationship side with my wife uh, and my friends uh, is, is vital. So you gave the illustration, maybe it's working 10 hours a week or whatever. I don't know if I have a specific hours, but I want the ability to say, I don't want the work or I will get the work. Can we make sure we articulate exactly uh, what the time frame is, is all this needs to happen? Because in the mid middle of all this process, I'm going to be with my wife and my kids. I'm going to be, I'm going to be traveling. Uh, from a financial perspective, uh, I think the thing that bothers uh, a lot of us uh, at our age is, is healthcare. Uh, with change of control, uh, you you do have the ability to have some financial wherewithal to pay for um, your own health care. But having been in a corporation for 40 years that subsidized health care to the nth degree, uh, now all of a sudden it's on your plate uh, and you're not Medicare, uh, Medicaid eligible. You've got these gaps. And, and, I, and I think you're just always worried about healthcare, life insurance, and that, and that piece of it, more than, at least for me, more than just going to the grocery store and, and money out, out the door that way, or buying plane tickets and flying to Florida or Europe or wherever you're going to fly. Uh, those catastrophic elements kind of roll through your brain and go, what could happen? And so uh, I think if you can subsidize healthcare in a sense over the next two or three or five years and go, uh, all I'm really trying to do is, is create a little bigger nest egg for, for any catastrophic event. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have, it's, it's interesting because, you know, oil and gas, like kind of like you said, there's a, there's a big transition going. So some of our listeners are probably, you know, contemplating they're, they're on the tail end of the career and some of them are, are, are just getting started. So it's a pretty wide spectrum. Um, so f- for our younger folks who are probably listening and they say, man, I, I love what Alan was talking about, about doing the consulting thing. Uh, and maybe they, they want to do that, you know, a little earlier in their career. What, what advice do you have for somebody who would maybe want to hang their shingle earlier and kind of a, on a related note, what percentage of uh, your WPX income do you think would have caused you to consider doing this 10 to 15 years earlier? Maybe it wasn't an income number. Maybe it was a benefit because, you know, you mentioned healthcare is really expensive. If, if somebody were contemplating this maybe earlier in their career, if you could go back and, and think about what scenario would have to happen for you to, to have done this earlier in your career, what, what would you, what would you say? It's a really difficult question. Uh, my guess would probably be in the 75% range of, of, of income would probably uh, have enticed me a little bit. Uh, mm. I think we come from being the father of, of four boys. Uh, all four of my boys are, are very similar in some of their thoughts and very diverse in some of their thoughts, as you can, uh, you can appreciate. But the thing I see out of my four kids, which are ages 34 to 21, uh, versus what was in my uh, mindset, in my soul. Uh, I came from a very, very conservative uh, position. My kids tell me I'm conservative. I, I, do, I, I don't take a lot of risks. I, I, just, I go back to my supply chain side and my risk management, and I said, I'm, I'm reducing risk and eliminating risk at the most possible. I do that in my own life as well. Uh, so, uh, I was very, very comfortable, still comfortable in my own skin of being in a corporation. That's, that's okay for me. Uh, I don't see that in my kids, I'll be honest. I mean, they, they have great jobs. There are, some of them are in corporations, but I see that I want that life experience. I want to get out. I want that. So uh, I, that age of person yourselves included, uh, that's much more important. I won't, it's probably 
than it was to me. And, I, and that's hard to say that it's more important to you than it was to me because life experiences were important to us as well. It was just, mm -hmm. I think, a risk tolerance. Uh, so I can see where your age, uh, people, my kids' age, uh, just take the leap of faith. And, and uh, I think I had one of my kids, that was actually my youngest, we were talking the other day and he had been in a role with a corporation a little bit and wanted to do something different. And his words to me was, Dad, it's okay to fail. I don't think I had that, I'll be honest. I'm not sure I still have that. There's part of me that, no, I can't fail. But but he's right. It, it's like, so what happens if you, if you fail? Okay, you pick yourself up and you move on down the road. And so my advice to uh, the younger generation is that if those things are, are deep in your soul and that's what you want, it's okay, um, you know, because time is fleeting. Uh, I look by, I had uh, mentioned before, I had 40 great years, 20 years with, with two different companies, but I'm also to an age that uh, I want to go experience things. And uh, you, see, uh, you see the end of the horizon much closer now at my age than you do at, at somebody else's age. So uh, my advice was, would be to, uh, if, if that's in your DNA, then, then you need to go for it. That's great. That's great. Uh, and I'd love to hear just a little bit on the financial planning side uh, about going through a, a corporate transition. Um, and if to our listeners, if, if you've read our, our content online, we, we had a lot of content on the Anadarko uh, Oxy merger a couple of years ago. Uh, obviously, that change of control package, if you were legacy in Adarco and you were eligible for change of control, it brought a host of, of questions to your financial life. Um, Alan, I'd love to hear your perspective. As you go through a change of control um, uh, situation, what are the biggest financial tax, estate planning, investment questions that, that you're thinking through? Uh, taxes seem to be the biggest number one. Uh, you can appreciate your, you're looking at a change control package that uh, is coming in one lump sum. Uh, and so tax strategies, uh, especially if you've been around for, for decades in a, in a company, a corporation, then the, uh, the odds are that the, uh, the tax strategy needs to be at the forefront. You're, you're getting cash, you're getting uh, probably you've had uh, some deferred compensation in the stock, stock options or, or restricted stock or something like that, that that's all coming to you at one given time. Uh, so I think that's, that's the number one concern. The number two concern right behind it is, okay, now I got the cash, now what do I do with it? Uh, and you need to be able to uh, invest that wisely. Uh, all that's going to be age specific, all that's going to be risk tolerance specific. But, but I think about the, uh, how you people my age have migrated through the corporations. Okay. You had your 401k and you had your 401k match and you got some deferred comp and it just kept growing year after year after year after year. And now it's like, it's all coming to you in one lump sum at church. Now, what do you, what do you do with it? Uh, so I think that's the, the other financial piece. Uh, the, the third thing that's, that's probably not or could be considered financial but may not be considered financial, I would think through is, is most of the non-competes, I'm assuming with Anadarko and, and Oxy, uh, I know mine, uh, you have non-compete issues in there. And it's like, how do I get around a non-compete and yet create this consulting company? And so uh, we talked about listening. Uh, I think that's, that's important early on uh, with creating a consulting company, but when you're dealing with the change of control, I think you also need to be transparent. And so uh, we've all had transparent conversations with uh, our in-house attorneys, our general counsels. This is what I wanna do. Now, can we make this work? And so I think you need to take that step as well uh, you know, uh, you wouldn't want to put your change control at risk. Uh, you wouldn't want to put your consulting company at risk. You need to see if there's a marriage there. So uh, I think taxes, 
uh, investing and then making sure that you have a process to move forward uh, without competing and without risking anything that you, you've already uh, theoretically got in your pocket. That's great. Yeah, no, I, I love that. That's a, that's a really good framework for, uh, for thinking through that. Alan, it sounds like, um, there's been a lot, a great deal of purpose and life, and you've really enjoyed your time in oil and gas, all the various facets in which, in which you've served. Um, so as, as you were approaching retirement was, um, did you have a specific number in mind when you thought, Hey, now, now's the time. When did you feel, you know, since you are kind of very conscious of risk, how did you think about, you know, getting in a spot where you were comfortable enough to entertain retirement or reducing hours? Was it, was it a number? Was it a number of years? Uh, do you have any thoughts there for our listeners on how, how you came? And I know it's a personal decision, but I'm curious how you kind of came to that number or identify when you could, when you could do yeah. this. I think having the low, low risk tolerance, you're always looking for uh, that next rung in the ladder of, okay, I just took that risk off the table. So I think there's always that 65 type time frame out there of uh, now I'm eligible for the Medicare and the, and the uh, Medicaid's and those type of things of the world. So uh, I'm, those are also big triggers when it comes to 401ks and, and all of that. I don't have penalties involved. So uh, I think you're always looking at that. Uh, there was always a number of 55 in my head as well. Uh, and 55 was more of a lifestyle uh, type of risk profile. Uh, felt like maybe at 55, you're still healthy enough to do a lot of different things. Uh, so I think there's, uh, there's that side uh, of it as well. Uh, there's always a piece of me, uh, because of the roles you've been in, you, you've been in, in roles of leadership, you've been in roles of mentoring younger people through the corporations. Uh, I'll be honest, there's always that uh, piece of me that's wanted to go back and maybe uh, be a high school school teacher uh, a high school coach. Uh, and, uh, I look at my, my friends that have done that it takes a lot of energy. And I don't know if I've got that energy at 65 or 62, but at 55, I thought I probably did. So there were some of that balances, but, uh, I think the, what, what's moved me, I, I mentioned the low risk profile, but there, there is some of that innate in my personality. Um, uh, but I've been blessed at Oxy and blessed at WPX to always have been moving through the organization in different roles and never been in a role probably more than about three, three or five years max. It, it, there's, there's always been that next challenge of, hey, Alan, we need you to do this. Okay, I've got that. We'll move forward. And so you were always energized, you were always engaged. And so 65 uh, 55, whatever number that was, uh, almost took a back seat to, you know what, I get the next challenge and let's go for it. Let's go conquer. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense. And <clears throat> this is something we can link in the show notes, but, uh, our last newsletter covered that topic in detail. There's so many different financial planning, uh, things to discuss from age 55 on, uh, if you want to entertain early retirement, there's a lot of strategies to do it. Uh, but then there's also a host of tax and estate planning decisions from age 62 to 72. Um, and tremendous opportunity to lower your lifetime tax bill with uh, proactive strategies there. So we'll link some of, uh, some of our resources in the show notes on that topic. Um, Alan, I'd love to finish up with a with a family uh, estate planning type question. And, you know, a lot of this comes from, I, uh, I know your son, Blaine, and, and Blaine is someone I look up to a great deal. Uh, when I met Blaine, he was president of his fraternity at Arkansas. And uh, Blaine is just someone who thrives at everything he does. Um, he's excellent in his career. He's an excellent husband. He's an excellent father. Um, and so I'd love to just hear uh, a little bit more about 
passing down values um, as you think through, you know, you, you have maybe deferred comp 401k pension. And, and at some point, hopefully you live for another 40 years, uh, but at some point you're going to pass down assets uh, to your children. Um, and so I'd love to just, just hear your perspective on what do you think you did well versus what is something you would change if you could do it all over again in terms of passing down values to your children? Interesting you, you bring that up because uh, I just lost my father seven weeks ago. Uh, my father was a minister. Uh, I think the sitting around the, the living room at my father's passing, uh, telling stories, uh, Blaine being there, some of my other, all my other boys, uh, the one theme uh, that came out was generational blessings. And uh, that was all passed down. Uh, you know, I think a lot of that was passed down starting with my father, <clears throat> not, not me, but my father. My father instilled a lot of those values in my in my kids. <laughs> so when I think about wealth and and passing down and those values, they all have a very common purpose, and it's about uh, God's work, God's blessing, and how do we bless others? And uh, that's been very prevalent. And I, I see that tremendously in, in all of my boys. Um, it's, it's about what they do with, with that wealth and how do we help others. And uh, so I don't know if I did it well, but it's soaked in to my kids. And that's probably the number one and the most important value within our, uh, with our family. Uh, so like I said, it, it started with my parents, with my dad. And uh, my dad was a minister 65 years and uh, that was who he was. And uh, so uh, that, that's the number one thing. That's probably the value that, that I, I crave the most. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that they've got it in them, uh, that they're always purposeful in thinking of others. Uh, so no matter whether you've, you've got $1 in your, uh, your portfolio or $1 billion, it's about what are you going to do with it? And, uh, you know, what, what, we as a family, we hope to do with it is, is to help others. Uh, the thing I wish I probably would have done better at actually probably has to do with uh, making, allowing my kids to understand the lifestyle that we lived, especially over the last several years, it was not the norm uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, we were able to, we actually had this discussion with my oldest son last night. It was his birthday and we were around the table and we were thinking of, of things and we were talking about paying for colleges and those type of things. And, and he mentioned that he didn't quite under, appreciate it. The other kids have mentioned they haven't appreciated it. But, but what we were allowed to do, what we were able to do uh, versus their friend sets versus whatever uh, was, was not the norm. And at age... 18, 19, 20, they, they didn't understand that. And maybe we should have restructured a way to allow them to be more purposeful in understanding uh, what they had. They were blessed with what they had and then maybe deferred what we gave them later or something. I, I'm not sure how we would have gone about that, but uh, being more, a little more purposeful in uh, allowing them to maybe participate more than what they did instead of uh, the mother and their mother and me writing checks or providing this or providing that. So uh, they've got a great appreciation of what, what the value of the dollar is and what to do with it. Uh, I just think we could have been more purposeful in, in that piece. It makes a lot of sense. Thanks for that answer. There's so much that goes into that topic and it's, it's one we love to discuss. Um, and Alan, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. It's great to hear your story and some of what's coming up. Uh, we're excited to, uh, to see how the next chapter goes. And, uh, I think this could also be fun, Jared, we, we should do a, a follow-up episode where we just discuss the entire topic 
of what it looks like to transition from a corporate environment and uh, head into doing your own thing. And we could we could probably spend 30, 45 minutes just talking about the different tax and the state planning and investment opportunities uh, that go along with that transition. So we might do that in the coming months. Yeah. And we'll, we'll need to have Alan back on the podcast a few years from now to see how things shook out and whether expectations were met or how things were different than expected or similar. But Alan, we, thank you for so much for being on the podcast. Really inspired by your story. Uh, I think you're a good example of retiring well. Uh, we see a lot of people who want to leave a job, but they don't know what they have in their next season. And it sounds like you have an exciting passion for helping the next generation uh, of, of oil and gas professionals and uh, your family. So we're really inspired by that and in your desire for generosity and multi-generational uh, generosity. And I think uh, that's going to serve you well in this next season. But thank you so much for being on the podcast with us today. Thank you for the invitation.